Wake up. It's the Sleep Unplugged podcast with Dr. Chris Winner. This is episode 48, Sleep and Pain When It Hurts So Bad. Well, welcome everyone to the Sleep Unplugged podcast. My name is Dr. Chris Winner. I'm a neurologist and sleep specialist and your host for this podcast, which is a very important topic. We kind of deviated a little bit from the hard-hitting sleep topics last week and instead focused on something that I consider to be a little trendy in terms of uh, sleep topics, mouth taping. And now we're back to really thinking about sleep in a medical sense and how it relates to individuals who are out there struggling with chronic pain. An important episode. Glad you're here listening with us. If you're new to the podcast, welcome. If you're a veteran, welcome back. I'm going to give a special shout out to the amazing school nurses in the state of New York. I had a wonderful time with you this week. Really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you guys about sleep and the students that you serve. I also want to give another quick shout out. We usually start the show off with comments, corrections, criticisms. Just want to give a, a shout out to Gary's Passion. He is on Instagram and wrote a really nice note about my book, The Sleep Solution and podcast. And Gary is out there working very hard to recover from a stroke and really is just putting excellent information out there from his own perspective about how nutrition and a good physical therapist and good sleep can really help you overcome significant medical difficulties and that really doves dovetails nicely with today's topic, sleep and pain, which I did talk about briefly in my first book, The Sleep Solution. But like menopause, it was one of the topics that needed to be cut down because of the size of the book. Um, and again, boy, cutting menopause and cutting pain were probably two big mistakes in terms of the creation of that book. Before we get going, we'll just touch upon the title of today's podcast, When It Hurts So Bad, a deep cut from the 1998 album, The Miseducation of Lauren Hill, which was a huge, influential, very important album of that year. Uh, if you're familiar with the album, Lauren Hill, the singer with the Fugees, just come off a very successful recording and tour with that group. She sort of whisked herself away to Kingston, Jamaica with somebody she had fallen in love with. I forget his name. I'm kind of blanking on it. Was at Tough Gong Studio in Kingston, Jamaica, which was Bob Marley's studio. And she recorded the album, which would become The Miseducation of Lauryn Hill, a very edgy sort of raw album that got tremendous critical acclaim. That thing... Everything is Everything was my per personal favorite off the album. And the song, When It Hurts So Bad, a deeper cut, sort of a reggae vibe. But she had a huge showing in the awards season. She was nominated for 10 Grammys that year, won five at the time. She was the first female to ever be nominated and, and win that, that many awards. She also won Album of the Year, which I think is probably the most coveted of the awards on Grammy night. And it was actually the first hip hop album to ever win album of the year at Grammys. Uh, just a tremendous album of, of critical and musical importance and remains at the top of so many lists of, you know, best albums of all time. So let's get into pain and sleep. I think it's important that we'll sort of divide the talk into a couple sections here we can look at pain as it relates to sleep in a couple different directions. I think the more obvious one is that individuals who struggle with pain are going to sleep poorly. I don't think that takes a big expanse of imagination to think about that. When we're hurting, when we're uncomfortable, when we are suffering with some sort of pain or injury, it makes it very difficult for people to sleep. In fact, I think when I talk to patients, some of the worst nights of sleep come when individuals have things like shoulder surgery, where you really can't put any weight 
on your shoulder. So you end up sleeping upright in a recliner when you're recovering from your rotator cuff surgery. It's very difficult to sleep when you're in pain. And, you know, God help you if you're on your back and, and roll over onto that shoulder, it can really be quite a problem. And there've been studies that look at this, you know, what percentage of people who are dealing with pain struggle with sleep. There was a 2021 Ontario study that basically looked at individuals who were struggling with non-cancer pain. And when you looked at the Pittsburgh sleep quality index of this group, and this was like 3,500 patients or more, 75% of them had problems with their sleep. Um, the, the, in that same sort of retrospective look, they were actually looking at patients who were using a different um, indices, the, the insomnia severity index, the ISI. And by that measure, looking at 2,500 patients who had data related to the ISI, 73, 72.9, 73% of those individuals struggled with poor sleep. And there's another study that I found really interesting is a 2021 study out of Saudi Arabia that basically said in individuals who have chronic pain, 36% of them met the diagnosis of depression. 66% of them poor quality sleep. And, and, and I want to pull that out just as a sort of a jumping off point for a topic that I'd like to explore a little bit here. I am not a chronic pain doctor. I am also not a primary care doctor. But by virtue of being a neurologist and a sleep specialist, I see a lot of pain. Either that's the reason they're coming or they're coming for some other reason. But oh, by the way, I deal with chronic pain. And I want to consider this one study, which is essentially saying, if you look at individuals with chronic pain, and look at the ones who were diagnosed with depression, which is only about a third, two thirds have sleep problems. So it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. And why I think that is so important is I feel like sometimes from my perspective, in the workup of chronic pain, there is a very quick jump to depression. It's, it's almost as if, you know, the, the medical field can't figure out why an individual is dealing with the chronic pain disorder. So we immediately move to depression. And while I think that certainly there are individuals who have chronic pain who are depressed, I think having chronic pain could be depressive. I would be very depressed if I was constantly feeling like my feet were on fire, like I had neuropathy or something like that. That could depress you, especially if it's taking you away from activities and things that you like to do. But I don't think everybody who has chronic pain is depressed. I think that there are a subset of chronic pain patients who simply have poor quality sleep and are not depressed. So to sort of quickly move everybody in this arena into a diagnosis of depression, I think sometimes we're not serving our patients the way we should. I mean, I, you know, when we talk about sleep disturbances in menopausal women, I think that that very quickly becomes, oh, you're depressed or, you know, pat on the head. Everybody has these kinds of problems. So I just want to point that out that, you know, in this study, and then I think in, in, in others as well, just because you have chronic pain doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be depressed if your sleep quality is poor. It's not, they don't always run together. And I think we, we will we'll do a much better job dealing with patients that way if we always tend to keep those things separate. I'm going to deal with your depression. I'm going to deal with your sleep disturbance. And maybe by dealing with one, we'll make the other better, but, but they are two separate entities. You have chronic pain and you have an itchy scalp and you have, you know, dry elbows, whatever. I mean, we can deal with these things independently. We don't always have to sort of pull them together and sort of say to the patient, Hey, I think you're depressed. 
So let's look at um, individuals, the relationship with sleep and pain the other way. And what I mean by that is an individual whose poor sleep quality is in fact causing their pain. That to me is a much more interesting relationship because, you know, I see patients all the time that will say things of the order, if I could just get my pain under control, then I would sleep better. Meaning that the pain is the primary problem. The sleep is just a marker for it. The sleep has nothing to do with it. It's just along for the ride. If I could get this bear trap off my ankle, which really hurts, that would solve the sleep problem. And I think you can say to that, yes, maybe, maybe it would. But I don't think it's always a relationship that moves in that direction. In other words, the bear trap causing pain, making you sleep poorly there is a relationship where your poor quality sleep is making you feel like you have a bear trap on your ankle. The pain is coming from the dysfunctional sleep. And that's complicated. Now, I wrote about this in, again, in my book, The Sleep Solution. I should mention real quick, I have two books, The Sleep Solution, Why Your Sleep's Broken, How to Fix It, as well as The Rested Child, Why You're Tired, Why Already Irritable Child May Have a Sleep Disorder and How to Help. The Sleep Solution is really a book for adults struggling with sleep. The Rest of the Child is really a book about sleep as it pertains to children from the time they're born till they head off to college. Just sort of an exploration of the various sleep problems that children of all ages, even teenagers experience. And I wrote about this relationship. And in fact, the study I'm getting ready to talk to you about, I included in the book because I thought it was so fascinating. And if you want to get in touch with the show or follow me, I'm at Dr. Chris Winter Twitter, Dr. Chris Winter Instagram. Uh, we have a YouTube channel that's the Sleep Unplugged podcast YouTube channel. We put videos of all of our um, posts up there. So if you want to get in touch with the show, you can go through the YouTube channel. If that's the way you like to consume your media, or you can DM me through Twitter or Instagram, just like Gary's Passion did. So poor sleep causing pain. The study that I mentioned in the book was a 2006 study out of Henry Ford Hospital up in Detroit. Um, and it had a real hit parade of, of amazing sleep researchers on that paper. We've talked about Tom Roth many times on this, on this show. Uh, Timothy Roars was the lead author. Uh, I think Mark Greenwald was on that paper and somebody else. I'm maybe Marin Hyde. There was a, there was another author. I, I'm just, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's probably a very important author that I'm blanking on. But what they were doing was looking at individuals and manipulating sleep variables and then measuring what was called finger withdrawal latency. Basically, you're putting your finger into a situation, I think that was heated. It's almost like the, remember in Dune, Paul has to put his hand inside the box, put your hand in the box. You know, the Benny Gesserit witch <laughs> says, put your, and he has to keep it there. And she holds that little gum jabar, that little needle at his neck. And if you don't, if you pull your hand out, she was going to kill him. And she was testing to see if, it, if he was the Kwisatz Haderach. I'm so excited for Dune 2. Did y'all see Dune 1? It was the most, uh, that was such a good movie. I'm a huge Dune head, Frank Herbert fan. Uh, but anyway, so it's kind of like that. You, I think you put your finger in a, an advice that's giving you a constant, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on it. But, but anyway, so when you pull out your finger, it's that's too that hurts too much, and then you withdraw your finger from that stimulus. I think is how it works, something like that. And what they showed was that if you shorten the amount of time that an individual slept by four hours, so I think one group got eight hours, the other group got four hours, one night, so just one night of shortened sleep reduce that finger withdrawal latency by 25%. And they also showed that this was a much more powerful effect if REM sleep was disturbed versus non-REM sleep. So again, REM sleep, about a quarter of our night, it's our traditional dream sleep. So there's this thought that in the name of the, uh, the article was sleep loss and REM sleep loss are hyperalgesic, pain-causing. And that study to me is monumental. 
Because for the first time, we're looking at relationships of I'm going to wreck your sleep or you're going to wreck your own sleep or something's going to get between you and a great night of sleep. And the consequence is going to go beyond you just being sleepy. So let's list all the things that we can think about that will happen in an individual who's gotten inadequate sleep. You're irritable. You may be depressed or gloomy the next day. Your concentration may be poor. You may be more emotionally volatile. There were studies looking at restricted sleep over just a few days showing that your bench press maximum is reduced or you're making three times more attention or detail errors in a task. Hell, I mean, Sherry Ma even showed that you ran faster, swam slower, hit a tennis ball 42% less accurately, all because of restricted sleep, not sleep deprivation, just restricted sleep. I got restricted sleep on my trip to New York to talk to the amazing school nurses, got into Charlotte, hanging out in the Admirals Club, getting ready to go get on my plane, and it was delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed, and I finally got to my hotel room at 3.30 in the morning and had to do my talk the next morning. So through no fault of my own, and I had to get some sleep on the airplane, um, I had sleep restriction. So my guess is the Albany school nurses got a little less than my best in terms of a presentation. You know, maybe I was more irritable. I don't know. Maybe that was the talk when I left and they're all like, eh, that was some interesting information about sleeping kids, but was Dr. Winter irritable? Did he seem irritable to you? I don't think that I was, but you know, you let me know nurses, if you can DM me, if you think you got less than your money's worth because of my American Airlines flight. So we have to be very careful when we look at this kind of thing, because what we're talking about is relationships. There seems to be a relationship between restricted sleep or restricted REM sleep and pain and disease. There's a 2021 study out of UPenn called The Influence of Sleep Disturbances and Sleep Disorders on Pain Outcomes Among Veterans. Same thing. There is a high prevalence of sleep disturbances and sleep disorders causing higher pain outcomes in these vets who are being treated with chronic pain. So if you look at these individuals, the chronic pain patients that seem to be doing the worst, having a harder time, seem also to have sleep disturbances or truly diagnosed sleep disorders. So, and this was a, this was a 2021 study, the study I was talking to you before from Henry Ford up in Detroit, 2006 study. And there's, there's several, several others. In 2022, a study came out of Harvard that said, look, we believe that there is an association between inadequate sleep or dysfunctional sleep and pain. This was in a a current pain and headache reports, uh, that was the journal, this was the study. But we don't know the mechanism and we suspect the mechanism is varied meaning that there may be several different ways that poor quality sleep or sleep disturbances are causing pain. We also think that we have to be careful because this has not been worked out yet. And what we truly have is simply an association. And if you listen to the podcast, I use this analogy all the time. I stole it from Karen Johnston, who is a neurologist at the University of Virginia. She was my program director and an amazing neurologist, teacher, stroke physician, just really, really great advocate for for young, dumb neurology residents. <laughs> so speaking, speaking from personal experience here, that she always said there is a strong association between individuals who carry lighters in their pocket and lung cancer. However, lighters in your pocket do not cause lung cancer. There's an association and it's powerful, undeniable. But if we're going to assume that something about a lighter being in your pants pocket is somehow causing lung cancer, we're going to be wrong. There are steps in between there 
that are actually the causal agents. And unfortunately, I don't think we know what they are. I think this relationship we can file in the strong category. If you listen to this podcast enough, you know I think about everything on a spectrum. Stuff that I really believe, stuff I kind of believe, stuff that's probably true. I don't, and stuff maybe, you know, kind of, you know. I, I think this, we can put this on the stronger belief. I, I don't think we're going to figure out at some point, oh, we were wrong that poor quality sleep, sleep disturbances, sleep dysfunction has nothing to do with chronic pain. I don't believe that at all. And I don't believe it based upon what I see as a clinician. However, if you're asking me how all that works, what causes that, we don't know. And this is nothing new. We knew that individuals who were inadequately slept or inadequately rested seem to have more problems with dementia and cognitive illness. We, we've known that for decades and decades. Only now do we seem to be working out that relationship and that cause, cause the causation. Maybe the inadequate sleep is creating a situation where the glymphatic system is not pumping out beta amyloid in the way that it should, because we know that that pump works 10 times better when we're sleeping than when we're awake. And maybe that multiplied over a lifetime is the reason why individuals are accumulating this beta amyloid and why we know that even in individuals who have that gene for Alzheimer's disease can seem to sort of sidestep it, delay it, if they're really taking care of their nutrition and their sleep. Who knows? So I think that we can say the relationship is strong. We just don't know what it is right now. I think that you would do well, you would serve yourself well if you have chronic pain to hear that and think, well, okay, well, we don't know why but we know it's there. So if I'm dealing with chronic pain, I'm going to make an effort to try to improve the quality of my sleep and perhaps its duration. So that leads us into our final section. What do we do about it? I have got chronic pain and I chose to listen to your podcast. This is all really interesting. What do I do about it? I, I think the first thing you do is you make sure that the quality of your sleep is outstanding. I think if somebody has chronic pain, you've just bought yourself an in-lab sleep study. Now that's completely up to you. I'm not saying that to manipulate the situation or capitalize on it. I, we've got plenty of patients. You know, we're not looking for more. But I think that if somebody says, look, I don't really have, I don't snore. I'm not particularly sleepy during the day, I don't think but I've been dealing with chronic pain that nobody can seem to really get a handle on. So are you saying maybe I should go get a sleep study? Yes, I am. And I think that the chronic pain buys you a ticket to a sleep study. And I think that an in-lab study is what you need. Is there anything wrong with doing a home study? No, but again, we've talked about a home study before in the show. It's going to tell you that you do or you don't have sleep apnea. Could sleep apnea be a source of dysfunctional sleep and maybe chronic pain? Absolutely. However, if that home sleep study is done and it's normal, I don't think you're done yet. I, I, I would still feel most comfortable telling a patient, shoot, man, you know, I would actually be wishing for something on a sleep study in somebody with chronic pain. I'll be, I, I tell patients that all the time. I hope you have terrible restless leg, terrible sleep apnea, whatever, because we can fix that. That's something that we can hang on to. So when I tell a patient, oh, I'm so sorry I put you through the sleep study, everything looks perfect. At least you can check that off the list and move on to the next, meaning that you've done something to ensure that your sleep quality, at least on that Tuesday night when you had your sleep study, looked really good. Now, the quality is established. I think it's up to you to make sure you're getting adequate quantity. And that leads into a 2021 French study. How does sleep help recovery from exercise-induced muscle injuries? There was also, um, it, was, it was basically, that study was looking at sleep extension, which I sort of credit to Sherry Ma, 
out at Stanford, who's an amazing person. Uh, she just gave a big lecture, I think, to the NBA at their combine or something. And she does a lot of work with elite athletes. And she's a great follow on Twitter, too, if, if you need one. And, and basically, they're saying, look, getting more sleep, spending more time in bed resting could be helpful to individuals with sport-related injuries and pain. So I don't think it's a big stretch to think, well, maybe who somebody who has chronic pain could benefit from sleep extension, more time in bed. Now, th th there is a point of diminishing returns. If you're already spending 16 hours in bed, I'm not sure 17 is going to make a difference. But I do think evaluating resting, sleep consistency, sleep time are all important. So we've got the sleep study. That's ensuring adequate sleep quality, sleep extension, good scheduling. We need adequate sleep quantity. We've talked about CBTI. Uh, that was the, the episode we did basically saying, look, you know, the scientific results are in CBTI is a cure for insomnia. That was February. That was the third episode 33. A UK study in 2022 basically said of the 3,000 patients that they looked at in all these different trials, that individuals who underwent CBTI for insomnia and sleep disturbances showed lower pain, improved anxiety and depression, and better sleep. So we've talked about the better sleep. If you're somebody who has insomnia and you know no chronic pain, but you have insomnia, CBTI, I think, is by far and away the most important thing that we do for our patients. And we're going to talk about CBTI and insomnia in our next insomnia. Our first episode of every month, we do something related to insomnia. Had a really, really great exchange with another sleep doctor, and we're going to explore some topics of CBTI and insomnia treatment, sleeping pills with that one on our next uh, insomnia episode. But basically, if you can inv inv invest an individual with CBTI, there is a likelihood that not only will their sleep and anxiety and depression improve, but their chronic pain can as well too. The final thing that I'll mention before we sign off here is that, and this was a study we mentioned, I, th I feel like we've mentioned it before. It was an Italian study that basically looked at individuals with chronic pain and said, hey, if you pick the right mattress, that might help. And in there, in this 2021 study, they said a medium firm mattress seemed to be best. You can take that for what it's worth. I, you know, I think that let's forget about the mattress and think about the sleeping environment. We talked about pillows a couple episodes ago, uh, the mattress, the sleep hygiene, you know, that was really what they were looking at is, Hey, could sleep hygiene help individuals with chronic pain. And, and there was actually a 2023, Brit this year, a British medical journal study looking at sleep hygiene strategies for helping people with chronic pain. So I don't think that that's irrelevant. Is your bedroom cool? Is it dark? Is it comfortable? You know, investing a little bit in that over a long term could potentially help somebody with chronic pain. Well, that's it. I, I just really wanted to kind of think about that bi-directional association. We'll call it right now. Maybe in a future episode, we'll be able to say the association is actually causal and here's why. But at this point, I don't think we can. If you're out there and struggling with chronic pain and not getting the help that you need, I sincerely hope you can find somebody who finds your plight and your problem of interest and somebody who can generate a lot of ideas and hypotheses to help you get through it. If you're stuck looking for that, I would encourage you to think about sleep as a mechanism for moving past or at least improving your chronic pain condition a little bit. So that's it. I'd love to hear your thoughts. If you're somebody who's struggling with chronic pain, I'd love to hear about it. You can DM me at DR Chris Winter Twitter DR Chris Winter Instagram. Again, my books, The Sleep Solution and The Rested Child are available wherever you get books, Kindle books, audio books. And you can follow us on the Sleep Unplugged YouTube page if you want to. I think the Catatherini episode, if you follow along with the show, the Catatherini episode is about to break a thousand. I think the second place video is not broken 200. So the Catatherinia is still going strong. Shout out to the Catatherinia community. 
That's it. Really appreciate you joining us for this episode of the Sleep Unplugged podcast. Until next week, sleep well.